side. Welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. Welcome in. I'm your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and a kid raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the 70s and 80s. As I do, just a warning for anyone newly visiting this show. We try to have some fun here. Healing, crying, humor, lots of sarcasm, especially this week. And please note, it is my own sense of observation experiences and never meant to offend anyone. Simply my perspective. Welcome into paradise. Would that be appropriate? I hope everyone's having a great holiday week. If you're in the United States, where most people are celebrating Thanksgiving, I won't go into that holiday or the history of it. Uh, not a fan, but I'm going to be a little brief this week due to traveling, being on the move, family fun, and frankly, a gut filled with complex carbohydrates at the moment. I'm feeling a little sarcastic this week, a little edgy, and some of the thoughts uh, as they do came to me throughout the week, and I thought, I'm going to share anyway, despite the fact that I thought about taking a week off. I'm going to dive in. I'm big on character development, not a secret on this show, big reader, like the entertainment value, all of it. Great characters grab my attention. They intrigue me. I enjoy the process of dissecting a great character, the nuance, the motives, anything you might find in the rarity that is every single human being. I see that, frankly, in myself as a stronger character trait. It's something I'm proud of. It also keeps me from judging others (laughs) because I try to look beyond the obvious. Not necessarily just what's being said, but also what I can see. And while I'm an introvert at heart and I value my alone time, I truly do. I have to admit that people are the two treasures, true, I should say, treasures on this earth. They're truly treasures, each of us. Mankind and people spend a lifetime digging up lost treasures and trying to solve the mysteries of antiquity and looking for rarity in anything. And and while I love all that, I think we can find it in each other, in people. There's only one of us that's ever going to be on this planet at any point in time in the history of it all. And that's fascinating. It's amazing. There's never going to be another you. There's never going to be another me. And so character, motive, desire, and action in each of us intrigues me. And it does in any character that I'm exposed to, whether literally in real life or in entertainment or in history. I'm borderline obsessed with this stuff, and I love a good character in any form. And for a Jehovah's Witness, there is no more important character in their lives they'll ever be exposed to or should be as intimate with, and I mean that in the best possible way, than their king, Jesus Christ himself of the Bible. I know, I can hear some people, particularly witnesses, ex-witnesses now saying, ah, no, Stacy, you're wrong. That's Jehovah. Jehovah's the most important. And I'm not going to disagree on that. But candidly, for most of us, there never is a Jehovah without Jesus Christ. And so he steps to the forefront as a character in our lives. That's especially true for the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses who are not part of what they call the anointed class or 144,000 or king priests or any other long list of special titles that goes with the people going to heaven. For those of us that are in line for living on a paradise earth, eating garden burgers, we cannot know or approach Jehovah. On our own. We've been taught that our entire lives. It requires us to follow Jesus Christ of the Bible. Pray a little bit, follow his rules. Most importantly, as we'll see, follow his guys out of New York. Then and only then will Jesus intercede on our behalf and we can get to know his father, Jehovah God. Now, if you're a Christian visiting this little show, Please note that Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus' ransom sacrifice makes it possible for us lowly other sheep, those not going to heaven, to attach ourselves to those that are going to heaven in order to even know him. If you're thinking, I have the Bible, I've read it, that's a bunch of BS, 
you would be correct. Jesus didn't teach this stuff. But we should all be grateful that he fixed that in 1919 with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Then Jesus, the greatest character arguably in human history, in 1935, after several centuries of letting mankind wander around in confusion, he then chose to announce that we could be his friends too. At a convention in Washington, D.C., he followed it up with some books and magazines and game on. What a great idea. What a great plan by the most important man to ever walk the earth, Jesus Christ. Sarcasm is dripping already. But back to Jehovah's Witnesses. They're told they live in a modern-day spiritual paradise under the care of King Jesus Christ. They must know him. They must understand him. All of which was made possible with his holy instruction manual known as the Bible. But get this if you're new to this thought. Even to understand the instruction manual, including the four Gospels, we still need the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. True fact. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses are currently acting as fellow kings and like a modern-day public relations team. They told us that they alone represent Jesus Christ of the Bible. I'm a guy that loves a good guarantee, makes me sleep better. So here is their guarantee, take their word for it, that is, if we want to know Jesus, we must do the following. From the Examining the Scriptures Daily in 2007, page 34, we're told, quote, Christ thus leads the congregation by means of the spirit-anointed, faithful, and discreet slave and its governing body, end quote. In case you missed the guarantee, allow for a couple more. The Watchtower of 1990, March 15th, page 18, tells us, However, excuse me, quote, however, the governing body are appointed through the Holy Spirit under the direction of Jehovah God and Jesus Christ, end quote. The Watchtower of 1973, July 1st, page 402, tells us, quote, consider too the fact that Jehovah's organization alone in all the earth is directed by God's Holy Spirit or active force. Only his organization functions for Jehovah's purpose and to his praise. To it alone, God's sacred book, the Bible, is not a sealed book. End quote. And so there it is. If you want to learn about the Jesus of the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, his character, what motivates him, and what he loves, you have landed in the best place possible if you are a Jehovah's Witness. He's not only their king, but he only reveals himself to the nine guys in upstate New York. What are the chances? Fascinating. The Gospels are considered classic literature. Jesus is arguably the most important human character in all of human history, and aren't we fortunate that he's chosen nine guys in upstate New York in the United States of America, no women, just the fellas, to represent him and to give us a sneak peek picture into who he is as a person and as a king. But here's where the rub starts. How do I say this? If you've read the four Gospels, because actually the Bible's got pretty good circulation, in case you haven't noticed, you'll notice almost immediately that when listening to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and reading the Gospels, the four books about Jesus' life, something seems a little bit off. And at the risk of a five-hour long episode, I would never do that to you, I'm going to try to explore this as briefly as possible on a week where most of us are probably traveling and trying to relax. With the end goal being that anyone listening might have a few things to think about once they turn this crazy show off. You represent the king of the universe. The king that holds our lives and eternal futures in his hands. And apparently, he wasn't able to handle the weight of that responsibility himself. So he asked for your help. 
He made the universe, DNA, an estimated 7 million animal species. Is now a good time to sneak in a Noah reference? Can't go an episode without Noah. In fact, the only thing Jesus didn't create was himself and his father. But much respect to you nine fellas for helping him out with this whole last days and salvation thing. But put that aside. More importantly, thank you for helping him teach the rest of us uh, all about himself. I want to hear review. Some of the things, I, I'll say three of the things that come to mind, including the character traits we have learned about Jesus, not from the Bible, not from the Gospels. We're going to do a comparison, actually. But what we've learned about Jesus from the nine guys in upstate New York who alone represent the king here on earth today. Let's compare it with the four Gospels and see if we notice anything. I'm going to go with number one. Something that jumped out at me immediately on my journey out of Jehovah's Witnesses, when considering what these guys said about him, was this. The number one thing I noticed was that Jesus Christ of the Bible is apparently today very, very forgetful. He forgets things a lot. You've heard me mention it here on this show before but I'm feeling sarcastic and edgy this week. And he's very forgetful, particularly during his most important assignment as a king and as someone who's going to save all of mankind from doom and destruction. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that Jesus one and only visit, to, visit, I should say, to the planet by way of an imperfect woman's birth canal was the most important thing he has ever done. He gave us all eh, three plus years of stories, parables, commands, and experiences to draw from as we then navigated a lifetime in service to him and his father. Am I the only one that was passionately curious about Jesus and what he was like as a child? How'd he deal with imperfect parents? Imagine going to spank your creator. That had to be awkward. Oddly and without explanation, the Bible left out the details of his childhood. How he navigated pooping himself. Did he change his own diaper? Or how he learned to walk? After all, he was training for walking on water in the near future. What happened during puberty? Including why he didn't use his teenage years to tell us how to avoid masturbation because he thinks it's really evil now. Or what it was like to have no acne. Or, or even grow his first beard. Can you imagine? He didn't share it. Imagine the horror he felt at seeing hair on his face. Something he, uh, today, openly condemns, according to the nine guys in upstate New York. None of that is included in the Bible. But we learn about such things from these nine guys. But what we learn most importantly is that by not including it, Apparently, Jesus is just very forgetful. Imagine how quickly he had to pivot and change all of his original plans, plans we still don't even really know about, when a naked guy and his rib, scratch that, I mean a naked girl, his wife, decided to listen to a talking snake and eat from a tree that no one can explain why it was even there to begin with. All imperfect parents put a bowl of candy on the table and tell their kids to look at it, but don't eat it, especially when you made them and you know full well how curious they are. After all, they're made in your image. Jesus included that in the Bible. While he didn't see fit to record this stuff for those of us made in his image and eaten up by curiosity on a daily basis, let's skip ahead a bit. Let's jump to the stuff that is really important. The stuff that is life or death for the rest of us, especially Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's jump to modern times, the last couple centuries. What has the guys he appointed to represent him taught us about him? I've got a few I just can't wrap my head around. Let me know if you've figured them out. I've mentioned my number one thing is that Jesus seems to be very forgetful. 
He just doesn't mention a lot of things or details that we are told are fact in 2023. I'm going to start at something that jumps out at me. Let's start with the nine guys in upstate New York themselves. Jesus in the Bible, well, it's odd. He must have forgot. He just never mentions a governing body. I know. He had three plus years in a ministry and, well, they run the show during his last days, but he never saw fit to mention them showing up at any point in human history, much less the last days. That strikes me as odd. It always has. It's a tough one for a Jehovah's Witness or anyone to figure out today. Sure, they claim that he appointed them, but, but aside from themselves, no one can really corroborate what they're saying. It's odd. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that, well, he did say to expect guys like the governing body to show up, but I, I don't know how to put this. It's very awkward. He actually said when they show up and make these claims to actually never listen to them or follow them. In Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24 of the New World Translation given to us by the governing body, we're told this, quote, For many will come on the basis of my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will perform great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the chosen ones. End quote. That's what Jesus of the Bible told us about anybody showing up saying they represented him. And he didn't stop there. In Matthew 23, 9 and 10 of the New World Translation, it says, quote, Moreover, do not call anyone, anyone, your father on earth, for one is your father, the heavenly one. Neither be called leaders, for your leader is one the Christ, end quote. From Jesus' mouth to our ears, right off the pages of the Bible, anyone showing up claiming they represented him, were him, or were the leaders associated with him, uh, we were told were dangerous and we were to ignore them. Governing body? Can we get a minute? Not a word. We have to take for their word that they are representing this same Jesus found in the Bible. But it's not like this is even a new message. He was watching on in heaven before joining us here, and he had the following recorded in the Bible early on, even for the Old Testament folks. At Psalms 118, 9 and 10 of the New World Translation, we're told, quote, it's better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in humans. It's better to take refuge in Jehovah than to trust in princes, end quote. I don't know. I think prince trumps anything called governing body, two words not found in the Bible anywhere, or even mentioned by the same Jesus. I really don't think anyone can explain why Jesus never mentions the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. He talks a lot about the last days and the outcome for those that don't follow him personally. He goes into depth on that. But in an act of incredible forgetfulness, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus just, well, apparently he forgot. The same nine guys that show us he forgot try to explain that, well, well, looky here in Acts, the apostles were the original governing body, but that isn't remotely true. It doesn't take much to do research and find out that just isn't true, including the fact that the apostles never claim they're a governing body. <laughs> Bible versus governing body. It's an interesting exercise when you're examining the character of Jesus Christ. And as a fun study exercise in this way, see the Apostle Paul. All we did get from Jesus regarding anyone but him was uh we should never ever listen to anyone claiming to come in his name all that time with his apostles 
Not a word about them being the first governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And if they were, you know, the questions start to pop. Why didn't he mention it? Why didn't they? Was Judas Iscariot the precursor to Tony Morris? I've got questions. <laughs> Who knows? But Jesus was apparently incredibly forgetful on all things governing body. Never mentioned it, never taught it, never looked his apostles in the eye and said, by the way, you are going to be the first governing body of my religion, my faith, and there'll be guys that come after you with a gigantic gap that lasts centuries long between you and some guys in the 20th century. Another thing not mentioned by Jesus, he forgot, and that no one can explain. But when looking at the character of Jesus, comparing the Bible to what the nine guys say in New York, it brings me to yet another auto mission from the king and one that I learned as a baptized Jehovah's Witness. Jesus actually forgot to mention uh, an organization at all. And I got to tell you, when I'm examining the character of Jesus by means of the Bible versus the nine guys in New York that claim they represent him, this one seems like a pretty big miss by the king. The nine guys in New York assure us it was always in his plans. In fact, when baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, you're required to promise your loyalty, not to Jesus, but to an organization. A question, or should I say baptism question, Jesus apparently forgot to share with even John the Baptist as he dunked him in the Jordan River. In the most important move of your entire life, a Jehovah's Witness is required to say they're sorry for anything and everything they've ever done wrong and then answer the following question with a loud yes. Quote, Do you understand that your baptism identifies you as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in association with Jehovah's organization? End quote. Imagine that. Huh. Despite perfection and everything Jesus had done up to that point, Jesus must have simply forgotten about these baptism questions because he went on to say the following in the Bible without any mention of this organization thing. Matthew 28, verse 19, a witness will recognize it, quote, Go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, end quote, should have been added, and do you realize you're part of an organization? It wasn't there. It's shocking, but apparently the character, the man, the king, Jesus Christ himself, forgot to mention this whole organization thing, along with the whole governing body thing. It's a shocker unto itself. And while I'd love to continue to explore just those two things he forgot, there's one that trumps them both. It's the one that just sends me off into a migraine headache as I lie on my pillow at night, or did, I should say, as a witness, as I tried to contemplate how this was even possible. Aside from those things, the all-important, life-altering memory lapses as explained by the nine guys in New York, simply don't say much for the one that I think trumps them all. It's my all-time favorite thing Jesus forgot to do, according to them. Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the Almighty God, he actually forgot to tell us his father's name. Did you know this? If you're not a Jehovah's Witness, or you're a witness who's never contemplated this, did you realize that Jesus absolutely forgot to tell us his own father's name? He did. I mean, wow, this one hits pretty hard, huh? It hits pretty hard. I'm sure all of us forget our father's name from time to time, right? We just forget our dad's name. 
sometimes even for three plus years when you're sent to run the most important errand in all of human history. The entire purpose of your visit is to save mankind with a message from your father, a father whose name you're apparently not going to tell us while you're visiting. Look, I doubt many of us call our father by his first name, but could we get just one moment where you tell the rest of us here on earth in the past and present his name? No? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Jesus. They are one. There is no one he loves more. His entire visit was for us to get to know his father. And well, in three plus years, Jesus decided to not share his father's name or even use it. Listen, don't panic. Don't panic. If this is firing all kinds of uncomfortable feelings, I'm here to help. It's not me. I can't take credit. But when you've experienced human birth and you're now you're going to know your eventuality, you're going to experience human death, you lean on your friends to fill in the gaps. And that's just what Jesus did. He has nine guys in New York, along with a bunch of guys that came before them to correct the book he had written for us and add in his father's name where he forgot to share it. Isn't that amazing? I learned this from Jehovah's Witnesses led by the governing body. It's all true. Jesus forgot to share it, but he's fixed that now by means of the nine guys in upstate New York. I'm not here going to get into a scholarly deep dive on Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim. I'm not going to do it. The absurdity of the modern version of Jehovah, the name itself, or anything else, I'm not going to do it. I'm also not going to get into Jewish superstition on uttering the Tetragrammaton on and on. There are far more scholarly people than this ridiculous podcast guy to do that. I'm going to simply say this. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses taught me that where Jesus, or the entire Greek, Greek, excuse me, <laughs> Greek scriptures of the Bible, forgot to mention God's name, they had the authority to fix Jesus' memory lapse. Isn't that incredible? What trust? These guys saved the king from himself again, while Yahweh, or the Tetragrammaton, I should say, appears almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament, it never has been found a single time in any New Testament manuscripts. But the nine guys in New York fill in the gaps by telling us it was just removed. Was it now? By whom? When? Where? Stop it. <laughs> That isn't important. What Jesus apparently forgot when examining his character, these guys have remembered. And they took the liberty of adding it back into the Christian Greek scriptures 237 times to make up for Jesus forgetting. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that absolutely amazing? Where, how they got this command, just take their word for it. They're the nine guys representing Jesus Christ as found in the Gospels of the Holy Scriptures. But get this, forgetfulness is contagious. If you think Jesus' forgetfulness is legendary, take a look at the collective memory of those same nine guys in upstate New York. From the divine name that will endure forever, the 1984 publication, page 23, they told us, quote, No ancient Greek manuscript that we possess today of the books of Matthew to Revelation contains God's name in full. End quote. Oops. Is an oops in order here? Oh, wow. Uh, so... Jesus did forget to use or share his father's name? He just forgot or he didn't? Got it? No. What? Wait a minute. What? I'm confused. Don't blame Jesus. Wait a minute. They're getting new light. I 
hearing from the guys Jesus forgot to mention in upstate New York that he in fact did remember and wouldn't you know it despite Jesus forgetting and admitting it it's really just the apostates fault anyway we just heard that it's not found anywhere in manuscripts but now we hear this watchtower 2010 July 1st pages 6 through 7 quote when apostate Christians made copies of the Christian Greek scriptures they evidently took Jehovah's personal name out of the text and substitute Kyrios, the Greek word for Lord, end quote. So, if you're keeping score at home, the nine guys representing the character of Jesus Christ as found in the Bible say, yep, can't find anything where Jesus used his father's name, must have forgot, but in the Watchtower of 2010, it's all the apostates' fault anyway. Jesus forgot, proven by zero manuscripts containing the word Jehovah, Yahweh, or the Tetragrammaton, but that was us apostates' faults anyway. Uh, evidently. <laughs> Jesus forgot, can't find it anywhere, just blame it on the apostates. We will add it back in for you, King Jesus Christ, as told by the governing body. Oh yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses teach us that Jesus Christ of the Bible is a forgetful king. I can never make it all work in my head <laughs> during my time as a witness. I just accepted it as 8 million plus people claim to do today that follow them. Because they too, like me at the time, had committed to an organization. But there are so many more examples. And here's a few honorable mentions in the interest of time on how forgetful Jesus is, but has been cleared up by his PR team, known as the governing body, the group he never mentioned, by the organization he, he never mentioned. Here's a few, just off the top of my head. Judicial arrangements, shaving, college, sexuality, playing sports, the blood doctrine, a meeting schedule, meetings at all, calling people brother and sister, holidays, birthdays, beards. There are so many things forgotten by Jesus during his busy trip here to the planet Earth. But, but oh, wait a minute. He did remember this. At Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31 of the New World Translation, we are told this, quote, Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. And you must love Jehovah your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul and with your whole mind and with your whole strength. Thanks for adding dad's name back in, by the way. The second is this. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, there is no other commandment greater than these. Sounds pretty simple. Thanks for having your guys add your dad's name back into the conversation, but still looking for the organization and the governing body? Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Jesus forgot. <laughs> Forget dad's name. Probably not tough to see why he forgot about an organization. And of course, the guy's leading it. On to the next thing <laughs> we can learn about the character of Jesus Christ from Jehovah's Witnesses. My second observation is this. Jesus Christ changes his mind a lot. It's just undeniable. We already covered that he forgets things, but we now need to cover that he changes his mind a lot. Personally, I'm very big on watching people's actions over what they say. Who is with me on that? Common? Look, we all reserve the right to change our minds. In fact, I very much encourage people changing their minds if you're considering joining Jehovah's Witnesses, if you haven't picked up on all the sarcasm this week. But what do we call someone who seems to change their mind constantly? Do you find them reliable? Do you lean into them? Where I come from, someone who is constantly changing their mind is known as fickle. What are some more inconsistent? Mercurial? I might even say we consider them unstable. <laughs> If you're looking at anyone and considering character and they constantly change their mind, eh, they seem to be a little unstable. 
If you're someone that has read the Bible, and then you go on to associate with Jehovah's Witnesses, the group that claims they alone can teach you all about Jesus, you soon see that not only is he forgetful, but like I said, he's constantly changing his mind. And I mean constantly. Which just leads to more questions for me. For example, did, did you, Jesus, learn to change your mind a lot from your father Jehovah? I'm asking the governing body for an answer here. Because from the time I was a kid and learned to read, I've had trouble with this concept of how the king says one thing but changes his mind a lot. At Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21 of the New World Translation, we get something like this, quote, And Jehovah began to smell a pleasing aroma. This was burning dead animals, by the way. Back to the quote, So Jehovah said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground on man's account. For the inclination of the heart of man is bad from his youth up, and never again will I strike down every living thing as I have done. End quote. Oh, Jehovah. We're getting a Noah reference here. It's sneaking in. And well, he made this promise in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. But apparently, much like his son who he sent and is our king, Jehovah changes his mind a lot. I'm guessing that's where Jesus got it from. Because, well, what's this Armageddon thing? After you said this in Genesis, what's this genocide against all mankind thing about? Is Jehovah just changing his mind? And before somebody here argues, well, Stacy, he said he would never again strike down every living thing. To which I will then have to point out to those people, uh, he didn't in this case either during the flood. Eight people, remember? Eight people. But Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus changes his mind a lot as well, just like Jehovah does. I've covered New Light ad nauseum on the show. It just never gets old. It's too much fun. But there's only so much sarcasm and bad humor you can insert. But if you're looking to learn about Jesus for yourself and you start with the Bible, then you move to the nine guys he never mentioned would represent him, the questions begin. Would you like some examples? I guess you're here. I'm going to share some. Let's start with the most important work ever done in all of human history, the door-to-door -door preaching work done only by Jehovah's Witnesses. From the publication Who Are Doing God's Will, excuse me, Who Are Doing Jehovah's Will Today, they didn't forget his dad's name, brochure, lesson 12, it says this, quote, We try to contact people at their homes. Jesus trained his disciples to preach the good news from house to house. End quote. Or there is this. From the Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, chapter 25, page 570, we are told, quote, However, it is only among Jehovah's Witnesses that virtually all young and old, male and female, participate year in, year out in the house-to-house -house ministry. It is only Jehovah's Witnesses who truly endeavor to reach all the inhabited earth with the kingdom message in obedience to the prophetic command at Matthew 24, 14, end quote. And well, in what is the most important work in all of human history, we learn something very important from Jehovah's Witnesses and their leaders. Jesus changes his mind a lot. Jehovah's Witnesses waste countless zillions of trees, not to mention hours driving around in minivans, taking coffee breaks, leaving literature from house to house as they tell people and lead us to believe Jesus has apparently changed his mind. You might be thinking, where is he going with this? What are you saying? Well, allow me to show you what Jesus said himself in the Gospels at Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 7, where it tells us, quote, After these things, the Lord designated 70 others and sent them forth by twos in advance of him into every city and place into which he himself was going to come. Wherever you enter into a house, say first, may this house have peace. And if a friend of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if there is not, it will turn back to you. 
So stay in that house, eating and drinking the things they provide, for the worker is worthy of his wages. And note this, quote, do not, do not be transferring from house to house, end quote. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, wait a minute, what? The governing body, the guys he forgot to mention, have told us that we are known for going house to house, that we alone do this on the earth. It's one of the identifying factors of the true religion, going house to house. But if I'm reading here correctly, Jesus, the character of the Bible, commanded us to never go house to house. Jesus at one time, evidently, see what I did there, didn't want Jehovah's Witnesses going from house to house, leading us all to an obvious truth that's undeniable. And the truth is this, apparently Jesus changes his mind a lot. <laughs> from the publication, Does God Care? 2001, page 30, we're told this, quote, do you know of anyone else who preaches about God's kingdom from house to house throughout the world? End quote. Actually, I can answer that with a yes, there are others that do this, but putting that aside, they must have known that Jesus would change his mind on this and make this the single greatest identifying factor of true religion among Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Because originally he told them not to ever do it. And Jehovah's Witnesses, by means of the group he forgot to tell us about, claim this is one of the reasons they're the only true religion on earth. He showed us all how to share the kingdom message with others in this book called the Bible, but well, he changed his mind about it in 1919 and went with a new model, a model that was in direct conflict with what he said in his instruction manual to mankind and a model that the governing body claims identifies them as the only true religion on earth. Coffee shops and donut makers everywhere rejoiced. It helped support an industry that was unexpected. It was an unexpected blessing. But skip all that and join me for two life-altering things Jesus apparently changed his mind on during the last century. Two decisions that completely altered the character of Jesus found in the Bible. It's undeniable. A character change brought to you by Jehovah's Witnesses leadership. Brace yourselves. Because these are big ones for most anyone that is familiar with Jesus of the Bible. When Jesus changed his mind on these two, Jehovah's Witnesses' lives were altered forever. And without going too deep on it, Jesus continues to change his mind, see the past few weeks of episodes. But let's focus in on two. Two that are so easily recognized by Jehovah's Witnesses as taught by the nine guys in New York. The first one... This one tends to shock people, and I'm not sure everyone's given as much thought as they truly should. But here's one that Jesus has apparently completely changed his mind on. And it's this. At one time, Jesus apparently really loved and had affection for apostates. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Apostates. Jesus really, really liked apostates. In fact, those are the only people the Bible tells us Jesus really spoke to. It was the vast majority, the Jews, the apostate nation of Israel, the Jews, of which he was a part of. I know, I know it's amazing, just amazing. He really only came here for apostates. Wow, has he had a change of heart, according to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Would you like proof? At Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24 in the New World Translation, we are told by Jesus himself, quote, He answered, I was not sent to anyone except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, end quote. And well, folks, if you haven't considered it, I can't imagine this is a new point for everyone. The Jews in Israel were 
full-blown apostatized from the Mosaic Law, Jehovah, the prophets, and a whole long list of other better people than they were, apparently. You know where I'm going. Jesus has apparently completely changed his mind on how he feels about apostates because he was the single greatest reason he paid us a visit. His words, not mine. And Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15 of the New World Translation, he says this, quote, For the heart of this people has grown unreceptive, and with their ears they have heard without response, and they have shut their eyes, so that they may never see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and get the sense of it with their hearts, and turn back, and I heal them. End quote. That was a description of the people he came to hang around with the character of Christ. And little thought or teaching is given to the fact that Jesus came here for apostates. Near as we can tell, he grew up among apostates. His life is a living example of how to treat apostates. Whores, tax collectors, fearful people, people with doubts about authority and teaching. The list goes on and on. Jesus of the Bible teaches us how to treat others that don't agree with us or even with him for that matter. But uh, here we are. He must have changed his mind because the nine guys in New York who now represent him alone tell us he wants all of us to view anyone that disagrees, doubts, or questions Jehovah's Witness leadership to be treated like this. In the Watchtower of 2011, July 15th, pages 15 through 19, under the articles, Will You Heed Jehovah's Clear Warnings? Quote, Avoid them, says God's word. Other translations render the phrase, Turn away from them. Keep away from them and stay away from them. There is nothing ambiguous about that inspired counsel. Suppose that a doctor told you to avoid contact with someone who is infected with a contagious, deadly disease. You would know what the doctor means and you would strictly heed his warnings. Well, apostates are mentally diseased and they seek to infect others with their disloyal teachings. Jehovah, the great physician, tells us to avoid contact with them. End quote. Apostates are diseased. Wow, has Jesus shifted gears. What a massive change of heart from the Jesus we learn about in the Bible, huh? It isn't tough to pick up the most populous published book in all of human history and read the four books about him and find that he often met with people in secret or he even spoke to women. <gasps> Can you imagine speaking to a woman as a Jewish man? He spoke to people that doubted. He spoke to people that were afraid. He spoke to tax collectors, guys up in trees. He even sent his apostles to speak with apostates and eventually to Gentiles, people who weren't even Jews. But we learn from Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus changes his mind a lot, that he now thinks they're all mentally diseased, and a baptized Jehovah's Witness should treat anyone who disagrees with them or has left that organization, the one he forgot to mention, that they are sick and toxic people we are to ignore. Never mind that Jesus also healed people with disease and, and people possessed by demons and crazy people. He's just a different guy now, according to the nine guys in upstate New York. And I learned all of this, as most witness does, by attending meetings at the Kingdom Hall. Since early on in the 20th century, Jesus himself changed his model to more of a, uh, a do as I say, not as I did type thing. That's what we are taught. That's what we are supposed to believe. In the end, we must accept that Jesus Christ, the character, the man that we came to know in the Gospels, 
He just changed his mind. He changed his mind during the 20th century. No insight into the timetable. No insight into the whys or the wheres. We see some attempts to read into things from the Gospels and, and a guy that didn't even know Jesus. His name was Paul. He got blinded on a road and then he made up a whole bunch of rules and then said, well, Jesus told him so. And much like the governing body that Jesus forgot to tell us about in the organization Jesus forgot to tell us about, he now tells us, just take our, my word for it. Take my word for it. But the biggest thing we learn about Jesus' character and our dissection of the powerful man that he was from Jehovah's Witnesses is the change of heart he had in how to deal with sinners. And it's such a polarizing, dramatic shift from the guy we find in the Bible. It's a big one. I've broken down what I think is one of the Bible's most powerful stories on this show before. I have a whole episode on it uh, as the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son. It's considered a masterpiece in literature, a masterpiece in character development, a story that incidentally is told in the Bible by Jesus himself. Feel free to see that past episode in a little series I called Storytime with the King, the Prodigal Son. It's on the podcast platform. I'm not going to here go into the endless, and I mean endless examples found in the Bible of Jesus forgiving people and setting the tone on how to treat a sinner, someone that had done wrong, thought wrong, been wrong. But tying in the last point, on those mentally diseased apostates with Jesus' own character and the fact that he came just for those apostates and how to treat sinners and people that don't agree with him, I point you to the apparently mentally diseased Apostle Peter. Apparently he was a mentally diseased guy himself. Maybe he was among the first. At Luke 24 and Matthew 26, my all-time favorite apostle, Peter, goes full apostate. Uh, we can even say he goes antichrist. Full apostate in the Bible, in a story Jesus made sure to have included in his book and that he wanted us to know, but has, I guess, completely changed his mind on. You remember, taking a peek at Matthew's account in chapter 26, we're told this, quote, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the gatehouse, another girl noticed him and said to those there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, those standing around came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for in fact your dialect gives you away. Then he curse and he swear, I do not know the man. End quote. Well, this is going to require a judicial meeting, isn't it? <laughs> We got a denial of Jesus Christ, uh, a.k.a. the edges of apostasy. We got a dedicated servant swearing, cursing and swearing. Oh my, there's a lot going on here in this story. A story Jesus wanted us to remember, but that he would eventually change his mind on. In the perfect story of forgiveness that ends with Jesus forgiving the mentally diseased Peter down the road and continuing continuing to use him prominently as an apostle and is actually the guy he uses to invite Gentiles to the party, Jesus never mentioned how mentally diseased Peter was. And oh, he, he apparently forgot to mention the, ju the judicial arrangement. What a perfect opportunity right here in this story to, you know, slip in the whole JW judicial arrangement. You know, getting John, James, and Andrew together to hear Peter's side of the story and decide whether to disfellowship him or not must have slipped Jesus' mind. Which led him to changing his mind on how to treat sinners when he formed the organization he never mentioned, 
under the leadership of the governing body he never mentioned, otherwise known as modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses teach us that Jesus Christ changed his mind in 1944, several centuries after Peter went sideways in that courtyard, but King Jesus had a change of heart. He needed to put something in place to deal with teenagers that took a bong hit or whose hands wandered during a makeout session. He must have been really stressed out before making this decision. He just stuck to the whole forgiveness thing for over 30... <laughs> ah, for over centuries. But then in 1914, he decided to... Yeah, I'm going to have to shift this thing. I'm going to change my mind. But perhaps the most important thing we learn about King Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses is that not only did he forget to mention punishment, but upon realizing he forgot to mention punishment, the judicial arrangement, or what an apostate is and how to treat them, he then decided to initiate the harshest form of punishment he could come up with. Shunning, disfellowshipping. The king that gave us the story of the prodigal son didn't see fit to amend the story at some point over several centuries in the Bible's existence to include, you know, the father and the prodigal son ignoring his mentally diseased son coming up the sidewalk. No, no, he had a change of heart and he just had the nine guys in New York tell us what to do in these circumstances and that he had changed his mind. He, he had them do that in the early 1950s of the 20th century that he would now begin this little thing he calls shunning or disfellowshipping into the only true religion that he was, of course, in charge of. He also, of course, decided to call this, um, quote, a loving arrangement, end quote. And he said this, in the Watcher of 2021, September, page 30, we get, quote, an unrepentant sinner is like a person who has a highly contagious viral infection and needs to be quarantined in order to protect others from getting sick." End quote. And when I read that, I just find myself thinking, okay, I'm waiting for the sequel to The Prodigal Son. Maybe it's Prodigal Son 2, Dad Changes His Mind. <laughs> because, well, family be damned. Family be damned under the Jesus that we know today as represented by nine guys in upstate New York. The Watcher of 2014, November 15th, page 14, says this, quote, Are you personally proving yourself holy with regard to not associating with family members or others who have been disfellowshipped? End quote. All of this is such a dramatic character shift, is it not? Huh? Looking just at the prodigal son and at his entire life in four Gospels, but just taking that one story, one of the most powerful stories now means nothing. <laughs> the story really just doesn't mean anything anymore. The entire weight of the whole story of the prodigal son means nothing. And well, when you're looking at a character like Jesus, that's what we call plot shift. This is a plot shift. Jesus is teaching us how to treat the worst of the worst, the mentally diseased, the apostates, the only people he came to, but he's changed his mind. I'm now going to ask everyone to shun them. They're going to be disfellowshipped, and I'm going to have them write letters to bodies of elders, and those three guys themselves, hot messes, are going to decide if this person should be let back in. And I got to tell you, when looking at this, no word yet either from the Apostle Peter who is sitting next to Jesus in heaven, or so we're told, and we can only guess, kind of feels like he dodged a bullet that night when he went full apostate, dropping F-bombs and denying Jesus. <laughs> he too apparently accepts that Jesus, as we know him, just changes his mind a lot. Must have been a little awkward for Peter when Jesus sent that message to the governing body in the early 50s, huh? You can kind of see Peter side-eyeing Jesus. Whew. Thanks for going easy on me back there in that courtyard. <laughs> Jesus forgets, and Jesus changes his mind a lot, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. 
Most great characters suck us into the story by taking us along on their character arc. That's what pulls us in. The same is true of one of the most important people, if not the most important person we'll ever be exposed to in terms of character, Jesus Christ himself. And so the third thing I like to point out or that I've put way too much thought to over the years that I learned from Jehovah's Witnesses in reference to Jesus is this. I already covered that he forgets, I already forgive, covered that he changes his mind, but one thing becomes apparent, and that is that Jesus reinvented himself when he got to heaven. He just completely reinvented himself. And what a character arc it has been. When we examine the Jesus of the Bible versus the Jesus we have gotten to know through the governing body, one thing becomes very clear. This has been one hell of a character arc. Jesus has truly reinvented himself since deciding Jehovah's Witnesses were his one and only true religion here on the earth. And I just want to very briefly in closing cover what I mean by that. I mean, gone is the Jesus who had no place to lay his head, replaced by current Jesus who owns billions in real estate. He's got lots of properties now. Gone is the Jesus who could take a fig tree or a mustard seed to teach a powerful story. In is the Jesus who owns a TV studio and creates kids' cartoons. Gone is Jesus who valued two coins from a widow. In is Jesus whose org has ATMs, an e-commerce site, and is happy to take your insurance money or your entire parental inheritance. Yeah, this one's big in his character arc. Gone is the Jesus who loved children and how he took them into his arms and scolded people who tried to keep little people from him. In is Jesus who keeps a secret database with the names of pedophiles hanging out in his kingdom halls and has even instructed his elders to only turn in those harming children if the law in their land requires it. Otherwise, shh, don't tell anybody. He's much more interested in real estate than he ever let on. He seemed to know a lot about money when he was here, you know, drachmas, widows with coins, etc. But now he has trouble budgeting for things he will soon destroy at Armageddon. Very confusing. And for a guy that tried to avoid crowds during his three-year visit, slipper, slipping away when they became overwhelming, he now encourages mass media, including putting his guys on television. Jesus has had one hell of a character arc with Jehovah's Witnesses. One hell of a character arc. The Jesus we get to know in the Bible seems so simple. He seems so simple. I loved the Greatest Man book, full confession. I loved it because I love the simplicity and the warmth of it. Jesus of the Bible is kind. He's balanced. So approachable. You could be an adulterous woman. You could be a tax collector. You'd be a little person. You could be handicapped. You could be sick. You could be demonized. You could be an apostate. He was approachable. He was so loving. So loving. Moved to tears. Even when his friend Lazarus died, knowing he could wake him up with a snap of his fingers, didn't stop him from hurting. He was so loving. And by that, he was so easy to love when you read about the Jesus we find in the Bible. So easy to love, so easy to understand, so easy to follow. One of, if not the most important character ever created for billions of people. But will the nine guys who represent him sure tell us a different story now, don't they? How can you deny it? Has Jesus, 
the one we've come to know in the scriptures, really, truly changed this much? I personally can only lean into his words found in John chapter 14 and verse 6, New World Translation, which says, quote, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. End quote. Huh. I'm reading, I'm rereading this, I'm reading it again, it's only a couple sentences. No mention of a governing body. No mention of an organization. No mention of shunning. No mention of apostates, doubting. No mention that he would soon be changing this and everything else he ever said or did. And I started out this week by saying, I love a good character. Jesus Christ is found in the Bible is an incredible character or person. The four books that give us insight into who he is are filled with powerful examples, stories, and commands that even someone who doesn't believe in him or a non-Christian can actually implement in their lives. If you're a Jehovah's Witness who has actually read the Bible, who has made knowing Jesus personally an important part of your life, and you then take and compare it with what the governing body is telling you about that same person, that same man, I'm limited and I arrive at only one question for you. Are we reading the same book? I want to thank you all for joining me this week. Such a pleasure. Glad we could spend some time together, even virtually. Wherever you may be, hug a loved one. Be blessed and be well.